The Motor Dream podcast is recorded on Walla Medical land of the Eora Nation. It always was and always will be the lands of the First Nations of Australia. This is the Motor Dream podcast. Happy New Year, everyone, and welcome once again to the Motor Dream Podcast, a show where we can dream just a little about what our dream garage would be if money was no issue whatsoever. I'm Connor McNally, and I'm so glad you can join me for Episode 9, which is also the first episode of 2024. If you've just discovered this podcast and have no idea what it's all about, well, you're in for a treat. I tell my guests that one day that they wake up and check their phones to discover that they receive a text to say they need to check their bank balance. They open up their bank app and suddenly discover their balance has gone to infinity. They are billionaires. As soon as they discover their newfound fortune, they get an email from a mystery benefactor that tells them that they can spend anything that they like and buy any car, bike or machine that they want but there is a catch. They are only allowed three cars in their dream garage. It sounds easy in theory, but as my previous guests have discovered, it is very difficult to decide what three machines they would have. You get to hear from drivers and riders from within the motorsport game, as well as those who work in the motoring industry. And on the odd occasion, you'll hear from some prominent personalities who all share the same passion for cars as well as motoring. Now, following on from my previous episode where I got to chat with former pro cyclist Rochelle Gilmore, I decided to keep the trend going with speaking to athletes who discovered a second career in motorsport. In this edition, I get to chat with one of Australia's most successful competitors in surf lifesaving. The sport itself enjoyed a tremendous boom during the 1990s, where the Uncle Toby Super Series established itself as one of the premier summer sports in Australia. Born out of a concept from a number of Ironman competitors in 1989 that wanted to form a professional competition, the idea was rejected in full by Surf Life Saving Australia at the time, and the competitors broke away in a World Series cricket and Super League style manner to create the Super Series itself. Despite the threats of lifetime bans from the sport, the series was a runaway success with live coverage on Network 10 for many years and helped make household names for many of its stars. One of those stars was Guy Andrews. An Australian open-age Ironman champion in 1993, Andrews would become a three-times champion of the Super Series, becoming one of the most recognisable faces of the sport. It was through this exposure on Network 10 and his series success that allowed him to tap into his other true sporting love of motorsport. Growing up watching the big names of the day at tracks like Lakeside and Surfers Paradise fueled his passion to pursue the racing bug later in life. And it was through two times Bathurst 1000 winner Tony Longhurst that finally allowed him to tackle a racing career head on. Andrews did the Bathurst three hour race supporting the Bathurst 1000 in 1998 with AFL identity Sam Newman. However, he didn't even get to do a lap when Newman crashed the car early and out of the race. But he would return one year later to partner with Longhurst and finish an outstanding 13th outright and second in his class. Since those days, Andrews has gone on to do some really cool things, such as racing the V8 Utes, the Mini Challenge, represent Land Rover as a brand ambassador, and in recent times played his part in Mad Max Fury Road and the upcoming Mad Max Furiosa as a qualified stunt driver. He's also done stunt driving work with Hollywood Stunt Driver 2 at Warner Brothers Movie World. Andrews is still involved in surf lifesaving, competing in the Masters category at both state and national level, as well as coaching for the Kara Surf Club. And he still finds time to do some track days and time attack style events with his Hyundai i30N, which he promotes via his Guy's Garage channel on YouTube. I watched Guy as an athlete with great awe during my younger years, and I was just as in awe when I sat down and chatted about all things cars with him very recently, where he shared some really, really cool stories. So without further ado, enjoy my chat with Guy Andrews. Guy Andrews, thank you for joining me on the Motor Dream Podcast. It's great to have you on. Oh, great great to get here finally and uh, to have a chat looking forward to it it's it's great to have you on and i've admired what you've done over the years you know, multiple uncle toby super series champion back in the days of your iron man racing and you've now transgressed into being a part-time race driver professional stuntman an adventurer you've done a lot of things in your career but 
Iron Man is definitely the one thing I remember you from because you, you were a champion back in the 90s. You helped create the popularity of Iron Man racing, particularly with the Uncle Toby series back in the 1990s. Do you look back on that with a lot of fondness? Oh, absolutely. It was an amazing era. And, I, you know, I actually look back on it and think I was incredibly lucky and privileged to to have that era in surf Ironman racing. Mm. And, uh, you know, it was a you know evolving sport and we came off the back of, you know, Grant Kenny and the Cool and Get a Gold movie. And then we had probably had a lot of less competition in terms of um, other extreme events on television and streaming and stuff. So like to get, you know, live coverage and, and have such a fantastic following, you know, ending up on Baywatch and all of this sort of stuff. It's, uh, you know, like it was just the perfect storm in a way where we had a very lucky to be involved in the, in the sport in that time. Back in those days, I, I want to run, rattle off a few of the stats that you, you've had. You're a, th- a three time Australian junior Ironman champion. You've also won the open Ironman championship. I think it was in 1993. And I've seen some of that footage just recently, plus as well as the under 18s title, a 10 time race winner of the uncle Toby super series, as well as winning the championship itself three times. That that's quite an incredible (laughs) accomplishment. (laughs) I know I like to rattle it off, but yeah, it's, it, it's just mind boggling how, how competitive that racing was back in the day. It was very competitive. And you know, it's funny, I'm a coach of surf life saving now. And a lot of the younger kids, didn't grow up in that era mm. of the uncle Toby's through the nineties. And so, because it wasn't officially part of the surf life saving, uh, amateur sport, um, a lot of them haven't even heard of it or, or don't know, you know, they can't just jump on the internet and e- easily Google it. Um, and so I don't have a whole bunch of Australian open Ironman titles in the amateur sport, but I've got all these titles in, in uncle Toby. So it's kind of a, it's kind of cute in a way. I go and do a session and coach some kids and some of the older parents know who I am and I, I'll jump in and do something in the water and they'll go, how come that old guy is so good <laughs> in the water still? I'm like, yeah, I've done a bit of this before. Cause it's almost like it's just been erased a little bit, you know, unless you grew up in that era and watching mm-hmm. it on TV, it's, in the modern era, it's almost been erased from history in a way. It, it, it's kind of a shame because you were part of that, that group of competitors that helped bring the sport into a professional era. And I, and I think it, it still has that element of professionalism now, which is carried on from that era. People like Guy Leach, Trevor Hendy, Craig Riddington, Dwayne Ties, yourself, uh, Jonathan Crow, and even the female aspect, when you look at Ren Corbett, Sam O'Brien, Carly Gilbert, those names back in the day, even Lin- Linda Halfwick, she was one of the young yeah. up-and-coming stars back in the 90s. Like those people, those people just really helped create that professionalism. And it needed to, because as you said, surf life saving was more of an amateur sport back in the day and the cry to, to have professionalism in the sport was kind of met with some resistance. Is that still kind of like that now or do you think it's embraced the professionalism a lot more? It's very much more aligned with surf life saving amateur sport and the professional sport are, are aligned together now, which is nice. And, it, you know, it's all amicable. And back then it was a bit, you know, World Series cricket kind of vibe mm. and uh, where we had the, the, the Ironman series over here, the professional series and then the surf life saving on the... The other side, and it actually was met with a lot of resistance in the beginning. In, in fact, they uh, wanted to ban us from surf life saving for competing altogether. And then it actually went to court and uh, was overturned. And we we were able to compete in the amateur side of things at surf life saving national titles and state titles, as well as do our professional series. And and as it turned out, yeah, well, you're correct. We were, you know, household names, back of cereal packets on television commercials doing, but we worked hard. We went to, you know, every time we did an event, in a state anywhere we'd go to all the schools and the hospitals and shopping centers and we'd meet people and and we built the brand that way our own brands and the, and the um iron man brand uh you know by hard work and you know we didn't have the social media back then and i'll tell you what um it, it certainly built a solid foundation for young nippers aspiring to come into surf life saving heard so many stories about kids being inspired to get involved through that era and and that's probably the biggest legacy that we left behind do you think when you were competing, it would allow you to find other nav- other avenues of sport. You know, once the surf life saving career came to an end, like did it allow you to find and channel those other avenues that you so wanted to do that probably you wouldn't have been able to if the sport wasn't professional? Well, it definitely opened doors uh, and opportunities. And I say that even today to my young athletes that are just training and racing now and wondering sometimes why they're doing it. And I said, look, the more application, you, the more dedication you have to your, to what you're doing right now, people notice that 
um, you know, in a person, their, their, their focus and their ability to be disciplined and to something, to a task and doors open for you. And that's mm. exactly what happened to us back in the Ironman series. It allowed, you know, opportunities to open up for other sports. So I was pretty much consumed in terms of training three times a day and racing flat out, but I was able to follow other passions like motorsport and different things uh, as well in, in my downtime and off seasons and stuff. And I want to mention 1998, you went to Bathurst. You actually did the three-hour showroom showdown, which supported the Bathurst 1000 that year. You actually went with Tony Longhurst and a factory-backed Ford Falcon XR8, I think, or XR6 it was. XR6, yeah. yeah, an XR6. And there's a very well-known story. I don't know if it's on YouTube or not, but Channel 10 covered you uh, because 10 – did the Uncle Toby series back in the day. Right. They they covered you learning the ropes of how to drive a race car from Tony Longhurst because you've already had that passion. You've already expressed that interest in motorsport. And then you jokingly jump into his uh, Castrol Falcon as it was back yeah, in the day the and did laps Falcon. around laps, uh, Lakeside. But yeah. the truth is you actually did a few laps. Tell us about yeah, that. Yeah, I did. I um, It was actually, if you, if you go back, I mean, a little ways, like in the in the – sort of when I was about 10, 11, 12 years of age in the 89, 81, 82, I was flat out already winning national junior Ironman titles. And every long weekend in October was my birthday, 2nd of October. I'd sit in front of the TV all day and watch the Bathurst 1000 religiously. And I was just addicted to those Group C era cars, Holden Commodores and uh, Dickie Johnson's Falcon. Yeah. And, and obviously – later on started to get the, you know, the group A era came through when there was Tony Longhurst in the, in the M3 and the, then later in the Sierras. And I was just by this stage as a late teenager, I was completely obsessed with being a race car driver. So <laughs> um, it was, and then, well, it's, a, it's a good story actually, if I, just I'll quickly brush over it, but like the uncle Toby's Ironman Man series in the, in the nine, when it started in the nineties, they offered a, the winning series winner, a, a Daihatsu for Rosa. That's right. A, a, to win the series. And um, I, in the first two years of the series, I was second to the great Trevor Hendy and I thought I was never going to win this series. And the, and the, and a lot of guys in the series were getting uh, sponsored with these Daihatsu for Roses. And I'd been second for a couple of years as Australian junior champion. And I, I couldn't get a, a free car out of Daihatsu and I was a bit shitty at him. And, <laughs> and then the guy said to me, the manager from Daihatsu said, oh, we'll get you into one. And then I, I win the series in 93 and they give me this this car as a prize. And um, he says to me, oh, you know, I told you you'd, you'd get one. And I thought it was a bit bit of a, you know, bit cheeky backhander, you know, like <laughs> I, I sort of heard it. And so I actually took the car um, across town. So bear in mind, here we are, I'm about 20, 21, 22 completely addicted to car motorsport and um, I uh, took the car straight across to City Ford in Sydney. I was actually trying to trade it in on a club sport Commodore and I couldn't get a test drive anywhere. And I um, I drove into City Ford and here's this green XR8 manual V8 uh, sitting on the, on the floor and it was an EB93 and um, I instantly traded the car on this <laughs> EB. I remember backing out into the street and doing a burnout in the front, in the street and driving all the way back to Queensland. And I, I needless to say, I, Daihatsu weren't very impressed. I bet they weren't. I <laughs> know, uh, but it was my car to do with what I, what I wanted. There was no uh, caveat to it. So I uh, traded it on a V8. Wow. But, um, the progression was there, you know, the, the love and the, the motorsport. I just wanted to have a V8 manual and, and I enjoyed that car. I went and put big wheels on it, and I drove past Bob Jane, and they had, you know, how Bob Jane always had the latest, greatest wheels. Yes. And so I said, I've got to have those wheels on my car. And the next door was the suspension place. So I said, right, lower it and do all this, you know. So I, I just loved it. And then um, come '95, I got asked to do a Celebrity Grand Prix, and I was actually exposed to proper driver training. Then uh, Thomas Mazira was the head driver trainer there, and good story. Uh, we had their little. Astras, the little, little Holden Astras. That's and right. We had a whole five days of, of fantastic driver training and I got so much out of it. And um, I remember coming up behind one of the other Astras, one of the other celebrity cars and just ducking up. Under, it was in sand and just ducking up under, down and on road just as we turned on there under brakes and come up underneath them. And I, and I went, oh, great move. And then I pulled into the pits and then the car pulled in behind me and it was actually Thomas Mazira driving, showing – the celebrity had to take lines and he came straight over to me in his accent and said, Oh man, that's a great, 
great move you did on me there. And I'm like, I, I couldn't forget it. I was so stoked that I passed Thomas Mazira and, uh, and he gave me a compliment, but it just kept feeding itself. Then I got a go-kart, started racing go-karts in the off season. And then come uh, late nineties, I actually sought out Tony and started and said, what can I do for you, Tony, in terms of your fitness for your racing? Mm. And um, Tony got me on board and helped him with his fitness and, uh, and then in turn um, realized that I was passionate about motorsport and that led up to this XR6 um, three hour at, at production car race with Tony. Actually, funnily enough, 98 was the launch of the a AU Falcon. That's and right. I was actually, I actually raced with Sam Newman. I don't know if you remember Sam. Newman. Oh, I do I, remember Sam Newman. Everyone remembers was, Sam Newman. <laughs> he was bashing into trying to get into some driving. That's and, right. And that, I, I jumped in and did a half a season at Commodore cup and paid for it myself and it was super competitive did all the race tracks i hadn't learned before and it was getting sort of seven eight nine tenths in, in that field of 25 i was pretty happy with it and then um drove at uh at um bathurst with sam newman and we qualified i qualified the car six seconds faster than sam in third place mm -hmm. and in the category and then uh ford put um sam in the car first and then six laps in, Sam bent the car into two pieces, and we didn't get to. Uh, I didn't get to drive. But um, so then the following year, I had to wait, be patient. I got a, an EL Falcon drive at Lakeside, got an AU Falcon drive at Indy, was second in class, and then raced with Tony at Bathurst, and we were second. Uh, we were only eleven seconds behind the winner. It was a V eight VT V eight Commodore beat us by eleven seconds. Oh, that's crazy! And and. Was Bathurst everything that you expected it to be when you went there back in the day? It was just, look, I, I, that little period there where you know, I did the Commodore Cup and I remember my first ever Commodore Cup race in 98 at Sandown and luckily I'd done laps at Sandown in the in the um, driver training. I was so nervous. I could hardly hold the, the um, clutch pedal down. My leg was shaking so much with adrenaline. Wow. And then it was torrential rain and... Uh, qualified about 12th and cars were spearing off left, right and center. We did four laps and I, I think I finished seventh mm. and they red flagged the race after only after four laps. And uh, I go back to there because all of my experience racing and the pressure that I had surf life saving and all the events that I'd done led me up to this point of sitting in the car going, I've got to draw on everything I've got from experience from another sport to get me through this moment. And that got me through those Commodore Cup rounds and gained a bit of confidence and experience behind the wheel. And then then when I wound up at Bathurst, same thing. You know, I really had to draw on that experience that I'd gained, that small amount of racing experience plus all of that other surf life saving race experience to get me through the intimidating track that is Bathurst. And uh, it seemed to work. I, I just went in there and just did my lines and just, just went for it. And, uh, in fact... My quickest time in the second, because uh, I drove second, Tony did the first hour and a half out of the second. Uh, I was only three tenths slower than Tony's best time in the end. So I was pretty pumped with that. But um, it is everything. It It's amazing. I've actually got a little group of mates that talk on Facebook now about driving and we go to time attacks and stuff up here. And a couple yeah. of them are just going to do the Bathurst um challenge coming up soon and i don't even know if they knew i'd done bathurst so i just sent them a little nats off result to say, check this out boys and they're like oh shit and i said and they go well, you know any advice i said just everyone else is in the same boat everyone else is going to feel nervous about bathurst just go out there and do your thing so i think that's what i did i was just good at racing yeah. you know my head my mindset for racing and dealing with pressure and uh one guy came up to me and he got i got up on his bumper and another au and in the warm up laps or something or practice laps, and he come up and he goes, "Oh, sorry, mate, it's my first time here." And I, I remember the conversation. I said, "Yeah, mine too." <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I'm just competitive, and um, yeah, just sometimes to to a detriment, I just go out a bit too hard, you know. Like, but it's happened. your competitive nature, though. It, it is within you because of that that surf life saving, and you're not the only, you're not the first surf life saver to transgress yeah. in a motorsport. Trevor Hendy, I know, has done one or two celebrity yeah. challenge races. Is probably yeah, one Dwayne. or two. Quite well. Yeah. Dwayne Tyser. Dwayne yeah. Tyser, yeah, he's done one or two. So Grant Kenny, of course. Grant yeah. Kenny was actually in the Bathurst three hours. That's you right. Know, um, Subaru. That's right. And he's a very good driver too. He not only did 
TV reporting as a race you know, in motorsport, but also in surf lifesaving. But he's a very good driver as well and did yeah. the Procast series for a while too. So did you did you try and leech on to, to Grant and try and get some advice from him when you did your Bathurst debut? Or did, was we're it... almost – we were debuting together. We were at the same same event. In right. fact, um, I was – because I'm so competitive, he was in a, a class above. He was in class BX, uh, WRX. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was in the class D XR6 Falcon. And um, I did remind him that I was only 1.6 seconds slower than him in the, uh, in the qualifying session. <laughs> <laughs> I should have been much slower. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, I think we might have actually, because we were 13th outright. And I think we might have actually been in front of Grant's car in the end. I think they may have had a mechanical. So it might have reminded him of that too. But the, um, but yeah, no, we were kind of just running in parallel doing our thing and it, it's funny when you get down there, obviously it's so busy in your pit and yeah. stuff that's going on. And um, I never really, you know, we hung out after the event and stuff and we had a lot of, a lot of camaraderie because of our backgrounds and that. And we thought it was fantastic that we're both doing the sport. And we, at that time, we were hoping that we were just going to keep going on with it. And uh, unfortunately, you know, with, with sponsorship and, and trying to stay in that sport is very difficult. It is exceptionally difficult, but you've, you've found ways to stay involved in motorsport. You've, you've done a lot of track days, as you said, and you've got your own uh, podcast and YouTube channel with guys garage, where you show off your track exploits and talk to different people within the industry, much like what I do. Um, and also you do stunt driving and you've, and you're an accomplished stunt driver as well. You've you've done uh, Movie World on the Gold Coast, and you've done Mad Max Fury Road. That yeah, would yeah. have been an utterly surreal experience to be a part oh, of Australian mate. movie history. To be a kid growing up watching Mad Max films, and then one day actually, well, you know, be in yeah. a Mad Max film it is surreal. And I, and I tell you this, um, I was at uh, a rewind how I got into the stunt stuff, but I I'd done. You know, I had a decent resume in in driving. I, you know, I also done a Target Tasmania and a, a bunch of stuff. And so, it, you know, I got into drifting, and it accum, you know, it accumulates over the years. And especially when you're passionate about driving, when you're not at a racetrack, you're doing other stuff, and you're pursuing, you know, stuff around the motor industry. And uh, also in there, I did the the um, uh, Land Rover G4 Challenge, and I was actually sent to the UK to learn how to drive Range Rovers and oh, Land cool. Rover Defenders and winching and all this stuff. And we did a around the world global adventure event on that as well. So like I'm way down the track with the auto in the auto stuff, when people will probably find that kind of strange or quite different to where I've come from. But um, but then, yeah, in 90, what it would have been, 2000, sorry, 2005, I was asked back to do another Celebrity GP. So I got another whole week of training uh, that time with Jeff Brabham. And uh, that was amazing, you know, having having Jeff as a, as a driver training. So very spoiled fair again. And then um, 90, uh, 2008, my late sister rings me up and says, there's an ad in the paper guy for stunt driving auditions for Movie World. And I think it was like 2007, 2008. And uh, I went, oh, that sounds great. You know, and I, I jumped on and put my resume in and got a uh, re- reply, come to an audition. So I walk into an audition. It was at Norwell Driver Training Centre in Queensland here. And um, and I walk in and there's none other than Warren Luff. Um, uh, there was, as it turned out, there was, there was a whole bunch of young lads there that were stunt drivers. And then... Three days earlier, I'd actually used my connections with Tony Longhurst to get <laughs> a drive at Norwell in their Holdens nice. uh, with their chief instructor because that's where they were running it. And he, t- he gave me a tip on what they were doing. They said, oh, look, I've been seeing them doing forward 360s and reverse J-turns. And, this, and so we're doing these things and this Commodore was getting a little bit of a – I thought I was getting an edge. So it ter- turns out that I was actually um, in my last – the final audition of 12 guys – there was about three or four guys that were actually working. One of the one of them being the son of the guy running the audition process. Oh, wow. He's now one of the top stunt drivers in the world, actually. And he was in my audition. There was another fellow who's now a stunt coordinator on the recent Mad Max, and then Warren Luff, and then myself. And I'm I'm there going, feeling I honestly often suffer from like uh feeling like I'm out of place when I go to a motorsport event because of my background. Or well, people wondering what the hell I'm doing there. And and I had this at this audition, but I made it through the rounds and we did all the three sixties and the the chief driving instructor from Norwell decided he was going to do the audition as well. And in fact, he'd show me how to do a forward 360 two days earlier. 
And then I remember doing the forward 360 in the audition and nailing the exit. You have to come out of it straight and go through some bollards. And then watching him do it and actually have to pull some block on to get through the bollards. And then he laughing to me going, I only taught you how to do that two days ago. And now you're doing it better than me. And I'm like, <laughs> sorry, mate. sorry. But um, long story short, I got the job. Uh, there was only 10 of us. Warren Luff was one of them. And two of the other fellows, so three plus me, four in that group of, uh, actually it was 10 of us in that round of auditioning. So 40% of that group that I went through got the one of the 10 spots in the actual uh, show. So he, uh, then, then I went on to uh, six months of training, learning to drive on two wheels and driving, you know, nonstop drift patterns in and out of set. And then two, two years, 1,500 shows later, um, a lady came through looking for... Uh, casting for drivers for Mad Max Fury Road and my ears pricked up. Unbelievable. That's really cool. And when you eventually got that role to be a part of the, the stunt crew, because there were some quite established stunt drivers and riders in, in that group. One of them was Stephen Gore as well, who well-known so, motor, yeah. motocross racer in his own right. Uh, yeah. What was it like on set? Was it Was it everything that you thought it was going to be or was it just something so big and outlandish that it just blew your mind in a figure. When you think about it, it, like you couldn't, you couldn't describe it to somebody and give it it justice. Mm. You know, we're in the Namibian desert. These cars are just incredible. Like, you know, a lot of them are, you know, some of them are extremely well engineered. Some, some are just, you know, they're, they, they, they all run and they all do things. Like, for example, I spent a lot of time in this Buick bodied, you know, 1940, 1938 bodied Buick or whatever it was with an international truck dual axle rear that was twice as wide as the car on a Land Cruiser chassis with a Land Cruiser diesel engine, you know, with a turret out the top and six guys hanging out the roof shooting flames and you can feel the heat of the, you know, and you've got the, the Giga Horse twin V8 next to you and then the, the trucks and you just, doing it you know and we'd been there for six months filming scenes every day and you're just almost doing it and then when you look back and see the vision and you're like i was there doing that stuff you know and then um what i also did in the lead up to ensure that i got on the team was that i went and got myself what they call as um, stunt graded so in australia you have to be uh, proficient in five key areas to be uh graded as a stunt person and uh I went and did that. It was there was a water there was a water element and there's a body control element, heights, driving. So I had a lot of the elements sort of covered, but I had to put it all together in a package and then present it to. Uh, they have a national team of coordinators that look at your your um your footage and all your or your experience and decide whether uh, you could work on set. And I I really wanted to ensure that I got on this movie when they came through to cast for it. And I so I went and did that, got it done, put it in, and then. Because I did that, I was able to not only just drive on the show, I was able to do other stunts as well. And so I was actually part of the pole cat sequence, which you see that famous sequence where the poles are swinging backwards and forwards on those wide axle vehicles attacking the the tanker. So I was actually on the poles on the back of the car and that, that sequence was filmed every day for, you know, eight to 12 hours a day for six weeks straight. And we actually, um, we actually got given a... Uh, Screen Actors Guild stunt uh, best stunt ensemble award for that sequence that year, and so that's something some stunties strive to get their whole career. And I managed to get it on the first job that I was working on. I'm sure some stunties think I don't deserve it, but anyway, I've got the plaque on the wall, and I'm I'm pretty proud of it. So uh, it was awesome to be involved. Um, yeah, and, and the settings, the vehicles. You know, one thing I wish we weren't, we're not allowed to take a lot of photos on set or, or share them. So we probably never took as many photos as I, as I wish I had of behind the scenes, but I've got a few pretty cool ones and, and, uh, and, uh, yeah, pretty proud to have been part of it. And, and I actually, this time last year was filming Furiosa. So I was actually on the set. So now I've done two Mad Max films. So <laughs> oh, nice. it's actually in production coming out next year. And, and that one's heavily motorbike dependent because it's a bit of a cast back, a prequel. There's a lot of motorbike stuff and um, I'm not heavily in background of motorbike, but done a lot of high end mountain biking work and, and on Fury Road in 2012, become good mates with Stephen Gall who lives near me and we spent a lot of time together and I've ended up on motorbikes in uh, in this current Furiosa film, not doing any of the, the major stunt stuff, of course, just a lot of the background fill stuff, but 
that was an amazing experience just getting dressed up and riding around on motorbikes and doing that stuff every day. Do you think if uh, 10 year old you that probably watched Mad Max back in the day would have thought that he'd be doing something like this 30, 40 years on? You know what? Probably would have because I, as a kid, and we're probably all guilty of this, <laughs> we dream. Yes. We allow ourselves to dream and have big lofty goals. And uh, I think it's only in adulthood where you start putting the, the, the handbrake on a bit, you know, when a bit of reality kicks in where, you know, when you ask me onto this podcast, you you said, give me your dream, three dream cars and money's no object. And I went, you know what? I've not thought at that level money's no object since I was a young kid because, you know, you get that adult bloody handbrake put on and mm. you think your dream garage is a freaking, you know, a Hyundai and a, <laughs> and a Land Cruiser. <laughs> Like, oh, well, that I'm is your, that, but your Hyundai, your i30N, that's your current car at the moment, which you absolutely fang around the tracks of Queensland and have a great yeah. blast doing it. Yeah, I do. I know, you know, I, I was missing driving so much. And when I went away to Mad Max and I was driving every day prior to that in the, in Evo 10s in the stunt mm. show. So I was getting my fix and then, um, I came back from Mad Max and I didn't have a car and a way of satisfying that driving passion. And, you know, I'm doing less and less physical racing, but I still have that urge to be competitive. And mm. um, I actually got a BMW uh, M, sorry, a M135 uh, uh, 2010 model, yeah. the DCT seven speed and coilovers and all the gear. And it was a great little car, but it was getting a little bit of age on it. And at the time I was daily driving it as well. And then I, I went, let's go sensible, get something reliable that's covered for track use. And uh, obviously the Hyundai i30N was was a logical choice. I got a bit of shade off my stunty mates when I said I'm getting a front-wheel drive hatchback. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that, would, that, that would have gone down well. Yeah, but I tell you what, the car, the car, the i30N, they have done – I mean, you can really tell – Albert Beerman, who they poached across from from um, BMW M, M division to create the N division, there's a lot of his passion in the vehicles, like mm. you know, from the from the being able to tune the chassis and and other dynamics in the car to uh, you know the electronic LSD and just just lots of little things at a budget price. And I've just been experimenting with that car over the last twelve months with um, with Time Attack here in Queensland and. Um, they're a little bit porky, you know, standard, they're about 1500 kilos. So I've, mm. I've ripped the back seats out. Uh, the category I'm in now allows the, the passenger seat out. So that saved me about a hundred, hundred kilos, put a race seat in it, harness seat belt. Um, haven't touched the, the engine at all. I've just, um, I've just done wheels and tires. So I finally got onto the best tires that all the fast guys are using, which is the Bridgestone RE71 RS. If anyone's listening, that's into their cars that, it's a it's a semi slick tire, road legal, but it's just really good tire for the front drive as well because it's quite stiff in the sidewall, so it yeah. holds that. And at my the suspension on the i thirty, the original pre facelift one that I've got, is a little bit. Um, you can't get any real neg camber on it because it's a McPherson front setup, and so it suffers a bit from that tire roll. You, you know when you when you're really hard on the front end, and so the stiffer sidewall in this tire really worked. And last weekend I set some good PBs in the uh, upper <laughs> Queensland this way. I was pretty stoked. And, you know, it's, it's, it's getting up around, you know, some pretty fast cars, but I'm actually in the, a bit of a, you might be able to help me with this, mate. I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to go faster and I'm reluctant to spend big dollars on a yeah. car, on a chassis because it's at the end of the day, it's a front wheel drive hatchback. Yeah. I can go faster. Everyone knows that you can go faster, spend money, but I'm thinking about moving it on, even though I'd love to keep it and getting into something that, you know, a little higher starting platform, maybe like an M2 or something. Oh, an M2 would be really nice. I well, think the OGs are coming down in price, so the originals. Uh, M well, I'm, an, I'm, I'm a BMW man, so yeah, if I had the it. choice, I, I would love to – look, personally, I'm an M3 man, and I would love yeah, the original yeah. OG – E30 model M3. I grew oh, up with that. Mate, I, I grew... longest, longest Richards version. Oh yeah, and the B and H model from the the two and a half yeah. liter uh, DTM version. Oh, love they're that. Thing, aren't they? Absolutely beautiful. And I still hark on about it. Like I, I still rave on and to the people. The corner speed on those. I just saw a video the other day, and yeah. the corner speed is phenomenal. Isn't oh, 
with the big brakes. I mean, it, that car was just built as a class car, but it was exploited to the max, to the Group A rules of the time, and it worked because it was competitive no matter where you took the car around the world. It was instantly competitive because it had yeah, that. It was cool, the that. right package. It was so cool. So I would love that. But if I was to have a current BMW, it would either be an M3 or an M2. And I know, I think an M2 won the six-hour at Bathurst last year with Cam Hill. Yeah, 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 yeah. and that is a quick bit of kit. But Very it'd be f- good to go for, a, you know, a club, obviously a club spec mm. um, uh, competition with the with the S, S55 motor. But, you know, I'm talking budget. I don't want to go too much above what I've got now. So the, the OG M2 seems to be... A little less popular, and it's got it's got the um the what well, the N fifty five in it, yeah. so it's it's um, but it's a good good option. What about and this is only a suggestion here. What about the A forty five AMG Merc all wheel drive? Good, that? good thing. And a, yeah, a friend of mine's got one, and I am trying to get my hands on it to do a review. <laughs> nice. um, the big thing with the uh, the all wheel drives, I I I really want to have something that's predominantly rear drive. I do believe yeah. there is a, a, a switchable sort of torque split in that a 45. I don't know much about the, the, um, the, that in that car. So that's why I want to get my hands on it. But mm. I do love to be able to just drive that car off the rear end. And I'm really missing that with the, having the front wheel drive car, it's doing everything so well, but I just love that throttle control and just sort of getting the car to rotate off the back, you know, probably from the stunt, stuff as yeah. well i just in that background but i really enjoy that feeling i just had a friend of mine um who actually raced at queensland raceway um over the weekend as part of the um the amrs or the super series yep. that's part of um the uh AASA. and he raced a e63 amg merc and that's a real wheel drive that. yeah it was up there wasn't it it is nice and that yeah. sound is just yeah all right it's beautiful. That yeah, they're a, cool, they're a cool bit of kid, actually. Yeah, <laughs> they really. It's really to not cool. have that shape, that car in the V8 still, isn't it? Really? Yeah, it's just amazing. It's a cool bit of car, and no mm. doubt if you do test an A45, that's going to be on Guys Garage, which is your little channel that you have on YouTube, and you've had a podcast about it before on uh, all the podcast platforms. It, it came out of, um, unfortunately, a very sad situation for you. Um, if it's okay with you, tell us about the beginnings of guys garage and what the channel's all about yeah well the underlying uh vibe of the channel was you know to, to just have something there for blokes to sort of you know enjoy you know and, and when i started out i wanted to just uh, the catchphrase was everything guys love just you know catch up play on words but but um i wanted to just review you know all sorts of stuff that blokes might be interested in from boats to cars to mm. planes you know you know um you know be a be you know, there's not a lot of stuff that's, you know, we have to apologize these days for having male focused um, channels and, 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 and things. And, and um, my, my, uh, my father had actually just, he'd suffered from prostate cancer and passed away in 2018. And I thought, you know what, I want to raise a bit of awareness around prostate cancer and staying on top of your health Mm. and men's mental health. And it sort of gave me that passion to sort of get guys garage going. I have noticed it's morphed a little bit less away from focusing on that side of things, but it's always that underlying passion of mine. Yeah. Um, Cause I seem to be getting, you know, more pull through and response um, with just car focused stuff. And so, and because that's my passion, uh, most of my stuff's just based around what I'm doing with cars and that, but I would love to, you know, grow it into, you know what I'd ultimately love. I'd love Stan or someone to say, Hey, you know what, we're going to get you and, you know, maybe one or two other hosts and uh, let, let's do like a, a bit like a Top Gear thing without being Top Gear, you know, have mm. reviews some different things that are all, all male, male blokey related, but, you know, whether that would get legs because it's just male related, I don't know. But, um, you know, that it's, um, you know, men's mental health is an important subject and, uh, and, uh, and so is prostate cancer and all, all um, things that men don't talk about. <laughs> That's the thing. So, uh, um, yeah, that was the, the, the passion behind it and, um, well, the driving force behind it to get, get it started off the ground and the passion behind it's obviously cars and, uh, and, and, you know, just documenting that stuff and, and developing, developing that channel guys garage. So it's been, it's been an interesting journey for sure. This is the Motor Dream Podcast. All right. 
I want to know a little bit more about what really makes you tick as a car guy. Like, like you obviously have a huge passion for it and yeah. it, it shows in how much you talk about it with great passion. So I want yeah. to know, first and foremost, what was the first car you drove? <laughs> first car I drove? Well, I was driving. Uh, my dad was an abalone diver in South Australia and West Australia and I used to get in when I was very young on his lap and drive Land Cruiser. Oh, nice. And so I, had, I had a Land Cruiser tray back and I had a passion for – anything four wheel drive because we grew up around the beaches. And then he was the first bloke in that group. They all had land cruisers. And before that F 100s, he bought a Range Rover and he was, uh, you know, the odd one out and he goes, Oh, it's cause it's got the coil springs, you know? <laughs> so, uh, nice. so, uh, yeah, I was exposed to that young and, um, always wanted to get a, an FJ 40 and take the top off, you know, and put a roll hoop on and yep. do all that stuff. And, but um, the first sort of driving I did was in the back roads in Port, St- Port Stephens where we lived um, in the 80s. There was nothing back then and there was plenty of back dirt roads and that. And my sister had a little Mazda Capella. Oh, and even back then, be cool. in, in the 80s, I knew that I could rotary swap it. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> so I'm, I'm driving around about 13 years of age, driving this thing around, you know, in the back of the, in the bush. And then so that was – then then she went and bought a um, – she was nine years old and – she bought a little Honda City. I don't know if you remember them. Little yeah, Honda I remember City. them. I remember them. Yeah. And she got the option mags and we lived on, it was red and we lived on a dirt road. And I rem- I used to just drive it up and down because I'd, I'd watch Wide World of Sports and watch Stig Blomquist winning rally titles in the Group B. And, he, and I used to watch the in-car and how they do the handbrakes and stuff. And I'd go down the dirt road and I'd handbrake this thing. And I remember one day coming down the front of the house and doing a one Audi handbrake park to the front of the house and my sister running out, ah, what are you doing to my car? <laughs> Wheel was off the ground. I'm like, yeah. Right. <laughs> this was not about 15 years of age. And then uh, and then my first actual car was a Holden Gemini manual station wagon that I used to drive sideways everywhere. They were actually a very nice little car. Back in it was the day. well balanced, actually. As an eight, as a seventeen-year-old, you know, I remember coming home in the rain sideways every night. You know, but you could get away with that back then. And yeah, it could look four-cylinder car. No one knew about it. And um, yeah, so that was. Then I bought a VW Beetle. I always wanted to have a Beetle, and I did all that up, pull every panel off it, and painted it, and put it back together. <laughs> Um, there, my first real serious car was the. Um, well, I had a couple of four-wheel drive sponsorships actually from Toyota. In my late teens, I was very lucky. I got um, uh, Newcastle Hinterland Toyota gave me a one of the early forerunners, the two door yes forerunner, and and it, I think they might have had one of them, or they had a Hilux on Back to the Future. The when uh, yes. the Michael J. Fox, and oh, I thought I was the Ants pants. You know, <laughs> had, it's funny how too. it's funny how Toyota are now sponsoring some of the current generation of surf life savers. Lana Rogers is one of those people that's sponsored yeah. by Toyota now, so it's it yeah, kind of so kind of come full circle. Real. Yeah, so I did all that, and then um, yeah, then I got the X uh, XR eight was the first sort of car that I thought was braggable, and I I remember taking it to um, Lakeside and just going absolutely mental and having no clues before I did any of the driver training. I would have just, I was sideways, understeer, side, you know, just going too fast. And Dick Johnson was there. <laughs> and I remember him because he knew me from around. He was just laughing at me, going, you're an idiot. And and then it wasn't until a few years later where I started to get some coaching that I realized how loose I must have been. Oh, wow. And, um, and uh, it's it's pretty cool. And I got a poster signed by Dick Johnson here in my garage saying, nice. you know, keep up, keep it all up. So, you know, it was it was it was a cool era then because, you, as you said before, the Channel Ten were running the V eights and and the Surf Life Saving, so they used to cross over cross promote a little bit. And yeah. In that period, I got to know. Actually, you'd like this story. I I got to know Barry Sheen because mm. he was he was commentating as well on, on Ten, and what a larrikin he was. Some of the stories he told me were just unbelievable. And then uh, I was at the go kart tracks. I had this go kart, and I was doing some testing, and and uh, Barry had one as well, and we were out there testing together next thing Mick Doohan pulls in to catch up with Barry I don't, you know they must have been talking and so he pulls in and his wife's in he's got a 928 Porsche and he's pulled up and we're running around going mental and this and then Mick Mick goes oh give us a go and um and then Barry said oh jump in mine mate and you can't wear my gloves because I've got a missing finger. That's you right. Know, middle, they, you always knock their little finger off the end of their little finger off riding those motorbikes. These guys are next level. And then, uh, and then, and then Mick Doohan goes, no, they'll fit perfectly, mate. And he lifts his hand up 
he's got no little finger either. And I'm just, I'm got my mind is blowing. I'm like 21 years old. I'm like, this is nuts. And then like, so he, they, he goes out and he, he didn't have a long sleeve jacket. So he puts his wife's silky uh, pink silk um, <laughs> jacket on. Like it's like a, some sort of added ass jacket. And sleeves are halfway up his arms. Goes out and ripping around. And I'm just like, this, this is just me at 21. You know, you can just imagine. I just wanted to be part of that world it was so so unreal and those blokes were so cool and even just the other day i messaged mick do and i said oh, i've got to get you to sign one of those flannels you're selling at the moment he goes yeah mate anytime i'm like well, wow that's cool so that's really so, yeah, some good times some good times that's really really cool um actually i, I must ask the, this question do you regret selling the xr8 i do now oh man that car mm. it was a great car and i had bilstein's shocks and springs all, all on it and um you know I, I, back then i i didn't realize it probably was alive and well back then but like this club level motorsport stuff is so popular now and well, after that car i bought a wrx with the idea that i'd go in targa and then you know, i did all the same thing wheels tires and then i found out you, at the time there was no category for all-wheel drive it believe it or not yeah uh, that's targa. right and i got rid of it and and i'd I just didn't realize, I guess before internet and you just jump on and find out about these club events and stuff, you know, I would love to have a garage full of all the cars I had. So, you know, the XR8 manual, you know, the WRX 90 was a 98 model WRX with, with, um, you know, all the suspension work and everything done on it. And then, uh, you know, I had a, actually at one point there, I had a, uh, an 80, 1984 liftback Celica with a, Sylvia rear end, Sylvia independent rear end, and a one J, the one J um, uh, twin turbo super motor in it. Nice. I was, I was drifting that, and uh, it was insane. So yeah, I could have a pretty cool garage if I kept everything. But I think every bloke's got that story, haven't they? Yeah, they certainly do. Actually, next question: What about of all the cars that you've owned, which is the worst you've owned? The worst. Mm, good question. Well, boy, probably not the. Oh, geez, the worst. <laughs> I've got a few, few bad ones I've driven but not owned. I'm trying to think. Well, let's talk ones. about the bad ones you've driven then. I remember uh, uh, driving an early Peugeot. I don't know what it was, but you know when you're younger, I was just thinking about this the other day. So I remember seeing Peugeots on in rallies and Dakar and different things, and my brother-in-law had this Peugeot, and I drove it, and I've gone, this thing is a pig, you know. And it was just – it handled okay, but it was heavy and – the engine just didn't rev out. And, I'm, and I've got this thing about Euro cars must be no good, but we're talking like late eighties, hmm. but it wasn't I just, I was just driving along the other day and something made me think of it. And I'm thinking, I was thinking about how there's so many great Euro, European cars, French cars that you don't. Um, and obviously when you're younger, you're driving something, you think, Oh, this is the good one. But it's not until you realize later on that I'm probably driving the base model with the shittiest engine and the worst of everything. <laughs> there is a good one, but you're just not in it. Exactly. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, that's part of becoming a car guy and learning these things over time. But Absolutely. That base model Peugeot in the late 80s, it was probably an early 80s model. And I'm sure there was a, a, a special version that I never got to drive. But uh, in terms of bad cars, look, I, I think, I've been fairly, I haven't owned anything bad. I've had some bad experiences and that usually comes down to bad maintenance. You know, I jumped into my wife's golf, uh, which hadn't been maintained. And, and, and actually while we were driving it, she was driving on the highway, the, um, the timing belt snapped. Oh, turned, turned the engine into tinsel, you know, and, uh, and I actually spent, uh, three days and replaced the engine myself. I dropped the front, pulled the front out, put up in a hoist, pulled the engine out and actually did a, an engine replacement with the mate and, uh, and that was a, I feel like between that car and owning uh, that 135 BMW for 18 months, I reckon I'm about a second year mechanic by now with some of the stuff that I had to do on that, <laughs> that N55 motor from, you know, oil, uh, the oil uh, uh, gaskets and everything and the, and the uh, filter gasket. So, oh my God, there's some, some learning curves in there for I, sure. I bet. Absolutely. All right. What about the best memory you've had in a car? And bearing in mind, we have to be very <laughs> it, P PG, PG about it. <laughs> oh, mate. I've actually been, geez, that to pick one, you know, I mean, you'd have to, you'd have to say um, any lap at Bathurst. <laughs> yeah. That's true. <laughs> it's insane. Um, uh, 
that was in a, just in an XR6 was fantastic, you know. Um, but you know, I got to test Tony Longhurst V8 supercar twice. One time in the rain on on wets, which was hor- horrific, and another time in the dry, and um, and and that was an insane experience. Um, probably for me, I only got ten laps, and I was sitting in the fixed seat position in Tony's position, and I'm five nine, and he's about six foot, and I was a bit stretched out, and so you know, I just didn't be, I wasn't quite confident getting stuck into it. Mm. That was another incredible experience. Um, driving, uh, the length of Laos in a, in a, uh, fully decked out Land Rover supported ra- uh, Range Rover sport, you know, crossing rivers and winching and doing all sorts of stuff, drifting through rice paddies. Um, some of the things that I've gotten to do, I've done the, um, the lines back in, um, in Utah on a, in four wheel drive in that with, with Land Rover again, going up that rock, fin rocks, um, cr- rock crawling up, stuff like that. So there's just, oh, there's a myriad of things to put finger on one. It's very difficult. Uh, um, it has to be something related to track and racing. Um, mm. uh, you know, I got to drive at, uh, twice at the Melbourne Grand Prix. Uh, yeah, you know, in a 120 IBMW <laughs> and, uh, and holding Astra, but damn, that, that's an amazing experience. But I think probably in terms of a driving, a driving experience and an all round, round package and the, the best fun I've had is Targa, Targa Tasmania, um, to wake up every morning and know that you're going to go and go as hard as you can on some of the best backcountry roads um, closed roads uh, and compare your times to other people um, is one of the most exciting things day in day out that I've got to, gotten to do and that that I would dearly love to do another uh, Targa event and um, the little car that I own now the i30n would probably be a good car to do that in um, I did the rookie rally that year it was only the first three days of the five of, of Targa Tasmania yeah um, and uh, I was running the i20. BMW, which actually was one of the celebrity cars that came uh, from a, a year ago, a year prior in 2005 in the um, Celebrity Grand Prix. So it was an underpowered little road car with a two litre motor, but um, fully prepped for track. And uh, and I just jumped in and just drove it as hard as I could. And and in Rookie Rally, it was, the only prerequisite is that you hadn't done Targa before. So we had Ross Duncan and actually leading the the rookie section is, you know, former Australian rally champion mm. in a Evo nine. And then I, I counted up. There was, there was 12 cars better than mine. There was, there was six Evo nines and six WRX STIs and two supercharged Lotuses. So I was about the 15th fastest car and uh, ended up sixth overall because every time I come over a crest, there'd be another tree, other car up in a tree and one down an embankment. And uh, yeah, so it just matter, you know, keep it on the road. And I was doing good times and there was another I-20 in there with some journos and I was ahead of them. So that was my direct comparison, the old team interplay as they they have. And uh, Norris Piastri, we'll talk about that later. Mm-hmm. And, uh, <laughs> and um, yeah, so it was... It was a good experience. It was it was great fun to you know get out and do that day in day yeah. out and and uh, oh I, I hadn't touched on that reminded me with the Piastri connection because I got to do the Mark Webber challenge down in Tasmania the adventure racing stuff and mm. uh, in Mark Webber's team so I've actually quite often speak to Mark on text and uh, ask him little uh, little tidbits of information about the uh, the background of things that are going on in F one of quite course of course and look we're fans of Oscar Piastri and he's done very very well. Uh, from your perspective, does he have the goods to make it all the way and be a world champion? I, I certainly believe he can. Yeah, he's he's real good. I've been watching him closely, and you know, I don't know what the hell is going on with these McLarens, but they're mm. just, you know, they're just. And he certainly seems to be keeping, you know, for his first year in his effort, and, and after having a year out as well, first year in in F one, he's he's certainly keeping Lando honest, and I think Lando has got a lot of potential that's obviously not being fulfilled with the McLaren right now. And I think yeah. you transplanted the two of those boys into, into the Red Bull cars that, that I don't know. Here's a, here's a question for you between Max and, and Perez. If you put Piastri and Norris together, would their points aggregate in this, in the Red Bull be higher than, uh, than the currently is right now? That, I, I that's a good that, question. That's a very... I reckon it wouldn't be far off because I think as a combo with Piastri, I think 
I reckon Piastri is better than Perez. I have to agree with you. Like I've seen... I don't think Norris is quite there with Verstappen, but I think as a package, they might have more points. I think Nolando is a little bit more vulnerable, whereas Oscar is very assured of himself. Like he's very, very he's confident. He's an interesting character, isn't he? Because he's... we obviously we were all directly comparing him to Ricciardo, who's a yeah. sort of out there personality. But when you just boil it down to the straight driving, and from what I know, Mark Webber always told me he modelled himself after Schumacher, very serious and down to business. Mm. And when you meet the guy personally, he's not that guy. And you see more of him, his personality now, he's not racing. But I think that's probably one of the reasons why Mark's looking after him as a manager too, because he sees that, you know, I don't know whether he sees that sort of serious, you know, dedicated sort of Schumacher style uh, in him or whether he's helped actually foster that. I don't know. He's very, interested. he's very modest. Let's face it. He's a very modest yeah. personality. I had the pleasure of having a chat with him for Trevor Long's podcast uh, a couple of years ago during the mm. time of COVID. And he doesn't say much, but he's yeah. very, very good with the, indiv- with the media when he needs to be, but he's, he does a lot of his talking on the track. And that's where I think a lot of the success has come from. Like what he did in formula three and then formula two, he did yeah. an outstanding job, and he, as I said, let the driving do his talking, and he did superb. Yeah, and I think that you know that's at the end of the day. I mean, that's what's going to get him drives, and yeah. you know the personality is great. But um, if he can take the right steps and get himself in a competitive car, it's going to be interesting to see how far he can go. So I just hope he doesn't get locked into that McLaren thing for too long. I, yeah. don't, I just wish they could get it together, but they just don't seem to be. A, yeah. The, um, Martin managed to do, make the jump, but you know, that was, that took a while too. That took a, quite a while, but you look where they are now. Look at Alonso. I mean, that, who would have thought that a Van Ando would be, Unreal, you know, he could, he could win a race this year. That's the crazy part uh, about it. It would be cool to see. It would be cool to see. For someone at 41, 42, I mean, that's just, yep. I just yep. can't fathom how, how he's still competitive after all this time. It's um, yeah, incredible. Yeah. yeah. It's pretty cool. And I know, um, you know, from a, my personal uh, physical racing side of things, I didn't really start to lose my physicality till maybe mid forties mm. as a you know, career professional athlete. And and obviously driving's very physically demanding, but it's not quite the same as doing a you know triathlon or adventure race or whatever. But you know, I can under I can totally get it and understand how Alonso is still there physically mm. uh and mentally he's going to be sharp as his experience levels just out of this world so yeah i'm, I'm all for it he can 100 percent um you know given the right machinery he can win races for sure i agree all right guy andrews we're now getting to the the crux of the podcast here so <laughs> one day you wake up and you discover there's a text on your phone. Do you wake up in the early hours of the morning to do, yeah, you know, teach the nippers or, or teach the teams in your in in Caro, isn't it? You're, you're part of the Caro. Yeah, so, yeah, yep. yep. So you get up early, head to Caro Beach, getting ready to to teach the, the teams and that, and you get a message and it says, "Check your bank balance." You open <laughs> the bank app and it suddenly discover that your bank balance has gone to Elon Musk levels. You're an instant billionaire and you think, <laughs> what the hell has happened? What have I done to deserve this? Yeah. You then get an email and it says from this mystery benefactor, you can spend anything you like. You can buy any car, any bike, any machine you want. However, <laughs> the caveat is you're only allowed three in your dream garage. So with that in mind, Guy Andrews, <laughs> what is the first thing you would have in your dream garage? I've got to have the new Porsche 911 uh, GT3 RS for my weekend motorsport addiction. <laughs> nice. Yeah, that thing looks amazing. It's um, it's just got uh, it's got all the right stuff, and obviously, yeah, uh, always always a fan of Porsche, Porsche, and uh, and uh, that car has just gone to the next level. And of course, you know, being mates with Mark Weber um, mm. and him being ambassador for the cars as well sort of adds that sort of interest level but i just think as a driver's car as it as you know roll up to the track i had this and my number plates gambit on my car and, mm. and gambit, you know it means it's a gamble but it's also the background on that for me is um the name uh given to one of the avengers in the old tv series called the avengers that That's i used right. to watch as a kid. And I remember um it wasn't actually gambit the character it was another character in the show but it intrigued me that um, I think it must have been an Aston Martin or something back then, but I'm, bear in mind I'm like this young, impressionable kid. And I remember watching an episode uh, of the show and um, 
he's a detective and he drives onto the racetrack and he wants to catch up with this crim who's a race car driver. He's out there doing laps in his race car and he drives his Aston Martin up, catches up to this race car on the racetrack, pulls up next to him and tells him to pull over. And I thought, <laughs> that's cool. I want a car that can drive to the racetrack do fast laps and drive home again. So that's the story behind my number plate. Why it's that's called. Cool. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, that GT3 RS, uh, GT3 RS is, is the ultimate gambit car for me. It's, oh, uh, it, it does. Drive, yeah. It does look amazing. Be competitive, drive it home. Yeah. So uh, half a million be, dollars. Yeah, yeah. Half a million dollars. Yeah. Um, has more power than the previous generation model and ha- has a lot of the aerodynamics derived from its motorsport campaigns with some tricks taken from Formula 1. Four litres of naturally aspirated Boxer 6 in- in motor, which develops about 386 kilowatts of horsepower. That's 525 horsepower. So it's up 11 kilowatts on the previous model and three more on the previous generation, 991.2, which is just insane. And yeah. Seven split, so like a eleven flat quarter or something, three point two to one hundred. Yeah. But the handling yeah. and the aero just, just is just all that. Oh. I think it's got three hundred twenty-five mil section rear tires on it. Like it, it'd just be you know roll up to a dime attack, you'd be at the front of the group. And then <laughs> nice. <fly home. laughs> that is cool. That is so cool, and it does look very nice. Although if you if you told that to Jeremy Clarkson, he would tell you that all Porsches yeah. are crap. That's they right. just, they yeah, are yeah. designed to literally kill you. That's what yeah, you, I yeah, will say. <laughs> just oh, more power. That's all. Exactly. Power. You just want more power just to go fast. That's what you want. And they are beautiful. They are a yeah. very beautiful yeah. bit of kit. All right. Yeah. The second car you'd have in your dream. Well, car. I'd have. I was. Just, I had a. I've always wanted one of these, and and I'm intrigued because of its breadth of capability. And I did a lot of work with Land Rover around the world, yeah. driving poor Land Rover. Actually, it was a draw, Land Rover driving tr- driver trained as well at all their online courses mm. drove the things all around the world with with the the g4 global challenge was actually a pretty cool event mm. so, um when i laid eyes on that um the the bala um version of the the range rover sport um that thing that thing is incredible it's so it's a supercharged v8 uh version bala exrs if you look that up there's about 100 and they're about, there's only about 10 of them ever made but uh, you know, five hundred and fifty horsepower, zero to zero to one hundred in like four seconds, and uh, <laughs> all wheel drive, and the thing handles corners and but then handles jumps and off road as well. It's sort of like, and they've got a road version of it. It's a very cool looking thing, wide body, two door sort of Range Rover Sport looking thing. So, I think that would be my daily. That and would then I can I can see you in that. Escape the apocalypse and, uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you can have a bowler and Mad Max Furiosa and that way you could get a good drive away. It'd be and perfect it, car for that. Absolutely. Yeah, but, you know, just, sm- you know, just belting along the beach or, you know, taking on tracks. And then that would be fun even to drive up and do different events because there's often like dirt, Kana cross type events yes. around here. That I'd love to get in and just have something you just throw sideways and, and not have to worry about, you know, bouncing it off the ripple strips and you know then but then it'd be hilarious to take it to a racetrack and actually uh you know chase a few road cars around in it as well so yeah i think that'd be a lot of fun to own there's a video that you actually just shared before we recorded about the the bowler the, the exrs and it's a going up against the Caterham seven super sport uh it's in the uk and there's a video of it on youtube courtesy of auto car magazine we'll put it up on the show notes it is actually really cool because the Caterham super seven super sport like it's it's light as anything it was almost faster than a bugatti veyron around the top gear test track back oh geez about 15 years ago one third of the weight of the uh yeah the exactly and it, and it, and it's the bowler actually keeps up with the cage room. It's incredible that this yeah, thing that yeah. almost weighs two tons up against what five hundred kilos of cage room, yeah. and it keeps up with it. It's just insane. It's really. Cool. I did notice on that video that he, I, I would have liked to have been put, him to be putting that wheel over a bit more gravel and uh, cutting a few more apexes just, <laughs> just, to, just to use the advantage of the suspension, but uh, keep, keep the cage room honest. Right. Basically, that's really. Yeah. That's so that's, really, that'd be a cool bit of kid. I imagine that as a daily, it'd be uh, it'd be a lot of fun. Like I said, I could see you in that. Actually, I really <laughs> could. All right, the last car you would have in your dream garage. Well, you know, you did put an unlimited budget on. I it. did. I, I did. Jet. Yes, I should get a, a a plane so I can fly around, but or a chopper. But I I have already given you my. This is one car that I would love to have in my dream garage. Yes, and 
was in, I was so impressed by it growing up. But the X E Falcon with the the Group C body kit, the big oh, wide body yes. kit, the Dick Johnson one. Remember when Dick Johnson raced that thing, and he had those great big wheels on it. Yes, that's what did it for me because back in the eighties, you know, everything was about sidewall, and then all of a sudden he's come out with that huge. I think they were nineteen inch, and they were super wide. Yes, nineteen inch uh, wheel rim with a really low profile slick and a and a chrome edge. You know, it looked like a Simmons type wheel with the gold face and the chrome edge. But the the diameter of the wheel was what impressed me the most. Mm. I would love to build a dedicated replica of that with a with a with a modern V8 in it with that V8 sound. I mean, I'd be sh- sure I'd love to put a Barra turbo in it for the power, but it's got to have that V8 sound and, you know, modern running gear with the, with a big set of like, you know, 22 inch re- rear wheels or something and twenties on the front and just, just getting that look that they had in those early X, XE group C cars and big wide tires and, 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 um, yeah, it'd be a cool car because I've often thought, oh, would I like a 69 Fastback Mustang or some American muscle? But nah, um, the X, the XB, um, you know, the Mad Max yes. two-door hard, hard top was a close call between those two and the and the XE. But as, you know, if you had asked me five years ago, six years ago, I would have gone with the XB. But now because, you know, it's still, with, it's in 2023, you know, an XE is old now. <laughs> Yeah. And you don't see a lot of them around. And, you know, funnily enough, I've been thinking about the cars uh, recently because you asked me. And on Saturday morning, just gone, I saw the best finished, well done XE, wide body XC, and I've never seen one in the flesh, mm. driving down the street, not five kilometers from my house. And I, I'm like, look at that thing. It was goldy color and he had the big wheels nice. and the you know, wide body kit on it. And it was just very cool. So, um, there is a fella with one that drifts one. It's very, he's an engineer. He must be an engineer or he's yeah. got a blue. One. Yeah. I think I know, uh, Danny Probert. He right, it does, uh, quite, yep, yeah. I know Danny. He's Danny's got the Barrett turbo in it and it looks like a great piece of kit. I oh, would, it's beautiful. I would, if I had unlimited money, I'd just say to him, buddy, you build it for me and, you know, do that and, uh, and build, build one up for me. And I, I, I of course it ended up on the racetrack. You know, <laughs> as you do, as you yeah, do. Uh, me, right? <laughs> yeah. It's a, it, actually, I think anyone that has that money to, to do an, e, an XE Falcon as a group C replica, but with modern componentry, maybe even with a six speed box or whatever, I think that would be. And run that in muscle car masters. Is that old enough? Or what's the oh, parameter? We, that at the moment, I think it's only XDs. So I know, Stephen XD, Johnson, yeah. Stephen Johnson until recently ran an XD Falcon. Marcus Sakanovich has run an XD Falcon as well, but you can only run a four speed, but oh, yeah, how yeah. good are they? They even, I love watching them. Yeah. They are cool. I'd love cool. to do muscle car masters. Actually. I'd like to. Touring car masters. Yeah. That, that would, that, that, that I could see you doing that. Touring car masters yeah, is a really cool know. category. Guys garage logoed up with the, with the, yeah, I don't know. What would you drive in that? Oh, as long as it's at the front, right? Yeah. It'd have to be at the front. It'd have to be an XD Falcon. I think if you're going to, if you're going to go, you know, modern like classic. Aussie would be good. Yeah. You're gonna to have to go the XD Falcon, I think. It's a cool. Seem to be punching out some good power, like that. You know, you get a good, well-built motor, and they're up the front. Yeah. Well, I know that John Bow, like this is his last season in Touring Car Masters, and he's getting what six, close to six hundred horsepower, and, and he's yeah, to run. Yeah, yeah. And it's running a Holden V8. It's just crazy. Yeah, yeah. It's a. They go very, very hard. They're great. They're great to watch. They're great to actually listen to as well. They're great. Yeah. Great bits of kid. Great bits of kit. That'd be fun. It'd be very fun. (laughs) So your dream garage, the Porsche 911 GT3 RS, the Bowler EX RS, and a Group C replica of the Ford Falcon XE. I'm, yeah, that's a variety. That's a huge variety. variety. That's a huge variety. No one's mentioned a Land Rover as yet, but that's the first one, the Bowler. And I've seen them in Top Gear, and uh, that they're a lot of fun. Oh yeah, that that would be. I reckon that probably one of the most fun out of a lot of them because of the you know you, one minute you can be running up a track and jumping it, <laughs> and the next minute you can be you know on the on the road keeping up with road cars. So, That's so, awesome. Yeah, it'd be a lot of fun. But uh, yeah, good fun, good fun to dream a little. It just reminds me as an adult to actually you know you allow got yourself. To- you got to dream a little, exactly. Mate, thank you so much for for giving me your time to have a chat. It, it's been great to finally have a chat with you. I've been chatting with you online for a while, and I, and I've admired 
what you've done as a sports person for many, many years. And I offer you my congratulations for all of your success. And I hope we get to see you on race tracks again soon, like actually, actually competing, because I think there's sure. still a little bit of, of, of that fire in you that, you know, that hasn't Please. extinguished and you want to get back out there, I'm pretty sure. 100% keen to uh, to get racing again. But, mate, I really appreciate the uh, the time. It was a good chat and good luck with the podcast. It's going to be interesting. Thank you, mate. Thank you so much. It's really kind of you to say that. Thank you for coming on. What a chat and what a great human being Guy Andrews is. You get the sense that if he had not pursued a sporting career in surf lifesaving, we may have been talking about Guy Andrews as a professional racing driver because he's just as talented behind the wheel as he was out on the water. Some really cool stories from the time he got high praise from Thomas Mesera when being coached for the Australian Grand Prix Celebrity Race to cheekily trading in a Daihatsu Feroza for a Ford Falcon XR8 and raising the eye of Daihatsu as a consequence as you chuck skids out of the dealership. That's a cool one. And of course, working on Mad Max. What an honour and a privilege to be part of cinematic history and continuing the legacy that began with the very first movie in 1979. That's 45 years ago. Since I recorded the interview in June last year, I had an online catch-up with Guy just prior to this episode going live, and life for him has gotten a little bit more busier. On top of his surf life-saving coaching for the Kara Surf Club and also fatherhood, he's since taken on a part-time role as a driving coach at the Norwell Motorplex, considered by many as one of Australia's premier driver training facilities. It's also the home base for the Norwell Racing School, where some of Australia's rising talents learn their wares from the experienced Paul Morris. And it's also helped nurture many of the current stars of the sport, such as Brock Feeney, Anton Di Pasquale, Nash Morris, Shane Van Gisbergen, who's NASCAR bound in 2024, and of course, the 2023 Repco Supercast champion, Brody Kostecki, who's also the 26th driver to have won the Australian Touring Car Championship. You can check out the Guys Garage channel on YouTube just by typing in Guys Garage, as well as following Guys Garage on Facebook and Instagram. Oh, and while you're at it, check out the Norwell Motorplex on Facebook and Instagram, as well as their website at www.norwellmotorplex.com.au. Speaking of websites, head to the Motor Dream podcast website at themotordream.com.au where you can find previous episodes readily available as well as show information and links to all of our channels on social media. We're on all the social channels via the handle The Motor Dream, which is also the hashtag. And make sure you like and subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts, be it Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, and now on YouTube Music, which replaces Google Podcasts. Whilst you're at it, Please leave some feedback, be it a quirky car question or a guest suggestion, and make sure you spread the word because that's how we get new listeners to this little podcast. Thank you, as always, for listening to the Motor Dream Podcast. There's plenty more to come in 2024, so make sure you stay in the loop. Until next episode, please drive safely out on the roads. Thanks for listening to the Motor Dream Podcast. This series is proudly produced by Beast Productions. 